Good afternoon. On a rainy day, is there anything better than staying at home, snuggling up and reading a book? Well, I think with this audience, you know there is something better. Um, you know here because you have the extraordinary joy of having read a great book, sharing it with people you know, connecting with people you don't know um, over this shared experience, and then having the chance to hear from the author herself. So we thank each and every one of you for bearing the rain and coming out and joining us this afternoon um, for something really special. This is the 18th One City, One Book um, event, and we're just so excited. Um, my name is Connie Wolf, and I'm the president of the San Francisco Public Library Commission, and it's my honor to... Um, it's my honor to begin today's program with our land acknowledgement. The San Francisco Public Library acknowledges that we occupy the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone peoples, who are the original inhabitants. I'm sorry, let me start over again. The San Francisco Public Library acknowledges that we occupy the unceded ancestral home of the Ramatush Ohlone peoples, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as First Peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush community. Thank you. So today we celebrate One City, One Book program with Catherine Ma's extraordinary book, The Chinese Groove. As many of you know, One City, One Book is a citywide literary event that was created to encourage members of the San Francisco community, old and young, near and far, to read the same book at the same time. The goal is to build bridges between communities and generations through the reading and, most importantly, the discussion of one book. We also hope to make reading a lifelong pursuit and to build more a more literate society as well as spark conversation across the aisles by learning from each other's viewpoints and experiences. One City, One Book also allows us to support an author and let their voice be heard throughout every neighborhood of the city. It's the biggest book club you can ever imagine, and what a gift that the library and its staff and the friends and foundation of the San Francisco Public Library give us support each and every year to make this possible. So thank you so much. And I also want to thank um, Anissa Malady and Michelle Jeffries, two extraordinary staff members here for their leadership in guiding this program. And a special call out to our friends at Litquake and BART for partnering with us. So as a member of the One City, One Book Committee, I look forward to reading marathon books every year, reading a stack of books, all providing incredibly wonderful, fresh perspectives from authors from diverse backgrounds and experiences. It's truly the best assignment ever. But it's never easy when we start the process because we have so many options. Here in the Bay Area, we're so fortunate to have so many amazing authors. And I just want to give a plug out to authors. Keep writing. We want to read your book, so don't stop. Um, but um, we, we just feel so lucky to have so many books to choose from with um, people with compelling and meaningful ways of telling stories and engaging people on the page with their words in both fiction and nonfiction. Fortunately, the process never fails, despite so many options. One book easily floats to the top. And with the best writing, the best of storytelling, the best of San Francisco to convey. And this year is no exception when we all had the chance to read The Chinese Groove by Catherine Ma. It was a clear winner. I want to thank the entire selection committee for their time and commitment to ensuring the ongoing support of the program. What, why did we pick this book? Um, what moved the selection committee about this book was the rich descriptions of the city and neighborhoods. I mean, it was just great to read about the sunset. I can't, I just love walking through those streets now and I just, all these images come to mind. Um, but we also recognize that the book is, is, examines the challenges, the disappointments, the joys of what it means to find your groove, especially for new immigrants to the city. We all found Shelley 
and his journey so compelling. But finding your groove, as Catherine Moss so beautifully reveals, is never easy. It's always challenging, always full of surprises, with lots of missteps and mishaps along the way. Everyone can relate to Shelley, no matter what your personal experiences are in finding your groove, because we all struggle to find our groove, no matter what our backgrounds, our goals, our dreams, our hopes. And in a city where there is a complicated and very difficult history for Chinese immigrants, it is even more important for Catherine's Shelley to be all part of our lives as we come to embrace a more equitable and inclusive San Francisco. So here's congratulating Catherine Ma for telling Shelley's story in such an enjoyable and impactful and inspiring way and for writing this year's One City, One Book. Congratulations. So Catherine, as we know, is a distinguished author. She wrote the highly praised novel, The Year She Left Us, which was named a New York Times Editor's Choice and an NPR Great Read of the Year. Her short story collection, All That Work and Still No Boys, won the Iowa Short Fiction Award and was named a San Francisco Chronicle Notable Book and a Los Angeles Times Discoveries Book. She's also a recipient of the David Nathan Meyerson Prize for Fiction and has twice been named a San Francisco Public Library laureate. She holds a bachelor's degree with distinction and a master's degree in history at Stanford University, where she received the very distinguished Lloyd W. Dinkelspiel Award for Outstanding Service to Undergraduate Education. And if that's not enough, she then went to University of California, Berkeley, and got her JD and practiced law become, before becoming a writer. So there's hope for all of you lawyers in the audience. Um, <laughs> Um, and she lives here with her family in San Francisco. Um, and we're so delighted to have Natalie Bazil, who is the author of the novel Queen Sugar, here with us. It's always great when authors interview authors. It's just the best. Um, Queen Sugar, her novel, was a San Francisco Chronicle best book of 2014. It was long listed for the Crook's Corner Southern Book Prize, nominated for an NAACP Image Award, and adapted for television by um, writer-director Anna um, Ava DuVernay and co-produced by Oprah Winfrey's own network. Um, she, um, Natalie has an MA in Afro-American Studies from UCLA and is a graduate of Warren Wilson's College MS, MFA program for writers. And she is, again, one of our great distinguished San Francisco-based writers. So please join me in welcoming Natalie and Catherine to discuss this year's One City, One Book. Okay, so we finally get to get to it, Catherine. Uh, first of all, I want to say congratulations. Uh, this was this is a wonderful book, and uh, it's just such a pleasure to be here, and really an honor to be able to ask you about this book. For those of you in the audience uh, might, who might not know this, Catherine and I are in a writing group together, and so I had the great privilege, along with Bora Reed, who's here, uh, to really watch Catherine um, work on this book. Uh, we got to read early drafts of it. So it's just a full circle moment to be able to uh, celebrate this with you. So congratulations. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah. Thank you so much. <clears throat> it, it's just a, it's an extraordinary honor to be here. And I want to thank um, the San Francisco Public Library. Particularly want to thank Friends of the Public Library, which has been so much part of this One City, One Brick program. And thank you to all of you. I'm just, I'm overwhelmed. Thank you for coming. Yeah. We're going to have a fun conversation. Yeah. Natalie and I have not practiced too much. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Um, so let's just dive right in. And I would love you to start by sharing the story of kind of what inspired you to write this book. Yeah, there, there are many points of origin for this book. Um, but I have to say now, looking back, after the book has been published and it's been in many readers' hands, I have to say now I have a kind of understanding that the writing of this book really begins and ends with my father. Um, something I didn't really understand as I was writing it. 
Um, but there is one particular event which kind of kicked off the idea of Shelley and his father. And that is um, many years ago now, in 1999, my brother Philip and I had the opportunity to travel to my father's hometown with my mother and father. My father's from a really interesting area of China in the southwestern part of China, the province of Yunnan. He's from a small town, not the town that Shelley is from, but sort of that area. This was the first time that my dad was able to go home after many decades. He'd come to the US as a young man um, right at the close of World War II in 1945. And because of you know, the political upheaval that happened in China while he was here studying in the US, he wasn't ever able to safely go home. So he never saw his homeland again. He never saw his siblings or his parents again. It was just a terrible uh, tragedy. And here we were, finally, he was able to go back and visit his home and his family. And I was tagging along, feeling quite foolish because I do not speak Mandarin to any degree. And I was at the mercy of my little brother who speaks beautiful, fluent Mandarin. So I had to keep tugging on his shirt and saying, what are they saying now? What are they saying now? Uh, which was a good lesson for me. Um, we had a family banquet. And um, there was one man of my father's generation there who was clearly a member of the family, but no one was speaking with him. He was really um, shunned by the rest of the family, even though he was in the room. And actually in the, in the courtyard of the Lao Jia, the old family home. And um, later I asked my father, who was that man? And my dad gave me a very curt answer. He didn't want to say, my mom explained to me um, a little bit, but she didn't really have the full picture either, although she did happen to mention in passing, this was not really the source of the, of the um, estrangement, I think, but she happened to mention in passing that he was the son of a concubine wife. Not at all unusual for that generation. But I thought, oh, that's so interesting that he was part of the gathering and yet outside of the gathering. And that image stayed in my mind. And, and later, when I began to think about writing a book about immigration in part, about what it means to leave your family and home, I thought of that as a kind of metaphor, because I think the immigrant, in some way, fulfills that role. You're part of a community, but in some ways, you're invisible. You're part of something, but you're also to the side, to the outside. Um, and I just, I, I don't know, I started to sit down and instead of writing about this older gentleman, this young man presented himself to me. And I nicknamed him Shelley, I gave him the Western name, and off we were to the races. And it was a race to keep up with this young man and his very peculiar way of talking. Well, before I go on with any more questions, I would love for you to just share just a little bit of the book so that we can hear Shelley's voice and we can hear kind of how he inhabits your mind as you were writing. Would you mind reading just a little sure. quick section? Sure. Um, so Shelley is a young man. The, the book takes place in contemporary times for those of you who may not have read it. Shelley's a young man of um, <clears throat> 18, 19 years old and he he um, wants to come to the US and he has some American relatives here who live in the Outer Sunset neighborhood. They want nothing to do with this young man, and he imposes himself on this family. He kind of worms his way into the lives of his American relatives. Um, and the book is about him making his way, um, both in the sense of um, coming into his own as a young adult, but also trying to make his way in America, trying to learn what it is to be a member of the community in San Francisco. And he, um, this scene takes place soon after Shelley has arrived. It's just the, the day that he's flown. He's never been on an airplane before, so that's sort of amazing to him. And he has landed on the doorstep of his Uncle Ted and his Aunt Aviva, who are actually distant cousins. And um, he's hanging out in their backyard um, in the outer sunset and um, eavesdropping. I'd grown sleepy again. 
I crawled into the bouncy castle and lay there drowsily, listening to a bird calling for its mate. I curled and dozed, dreaming of houses colorful and vast. When I awoke, I didn't know at first where I was. I thought I should go and check on father and prepare his supper as always. And then I remembered that I'd left good Joe and rehomed myself overnight. I rolled onto my stomach and squirmed halfway onto the grass. Two weeks, I heard Ted say, that's what I told his father. Two weeks? Two? I thought we decided one. Aviva's protest sent my worry fish darting. What would I do if they sent me away? I was the eggs. They were my basket. Two, Ted said. He'll need time to find a place to live. Well, good luck with that, Aviva said. There's nothing left to rent unless he wants to move to Bakersfield or Barstow. Does he have any money, do you think? He must have brought funds to get himself started. He's not allowed to work on a student visa. Startup funds, what an excellent idea. I had planned for the bank of uncle to make an initial investment, mm -hmm. but the chances of that happening seem to be thinning a bit on the ground. I can barely understand what he's saying, Aviva said. Do you think he understands us? Their voices had grown faint, so I belly crawled out of the castle, oozed over to the house, and flattened myself against the deck. Your father, Aviva was saying, I don't want to talk about it, Ted said. You never do. You never want to talk about anything important. You can't leave me with him to deal with him alone. You haven't spoken to your father in months. His fault, not mine, Ted said. Please, for once, can we leave blame out of it? I couldn't hear Ted's answer. They were moving about the room. Old, Aviva said. Immortal, Ted said. Help, Aviva said. Attention. Their voices faded. I tucked away what I'd overheard, storing it for later. Sometimes information was as valuable as gold. I hustled down the side path, around to the front of the house. I'm home, I called as I rang the bell. I had two whole weeks to change their minds. Plenty of time for persuasion. Mm, thank you, that's great. <clears throat> You know, I, I asked you to read that because I know that I, as, as a reader, always enjoy kind of hearing how the author imagines, you know, the, the character in the book. And I have some other questions about the outer sunset and research and all that. But since you've just read about Shelley, I would love to know a little bit more about how you came up with that character. You said that, you know, when you were with your father, you were observing this older gentleman. And... Shelley is so specific and he's so quirky. And I would, can you just share a little bit more about how he kind of leapt into uh, your imagination? Yeah, I, I went back not long ago and looked at an early, um, you know, the early, the early beginnings, the early attempts, which were pretty dismal. But that voice was there. That it, there was a kernel, there was something in it, there was something lively, there was something fun, um, there was just something uh, uh, unexpected in it. It was kind of a surprise to me that I began writing in that voice, and who am I to write in the voice of a, of a teenage boy from China, right? But heck, I'm a novelist, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> right. So, you know, you just make an experimentation, and um, I think in some ways, it was freeing. I just wanted to imagine uh, the life of a young man, the life of some, uh, the, 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 the attitude, the openness, the curiosity, the joy that comes from youth. So long ago for me now. Mm -hmm. So how fun to revisit it, right, this way. And um, I wasn't really thinking about my dad at all, but long time after I finished the book, I was doing a book event, actually, uh, in New York City, and I was being interviewed by my, my daughter, Hannah, who is a writer herself, and she said, uh, she was in Natalie's seat, and she said, well, didn't you really write this book because your father left China when he was a very young man? 
and it stopped me cold in my tr I'm telling you, the novelist is always the last to know what you read. Mm -hmm. It stopped me cold. I never even put that together. But yes, perhaps she was right. Perhaps in some way, I, I don't know, in my subconscious, it, it just some way my father's, that young man, my father, this Shelley is very different from my father's personality, but that yearning, that sense of the open horizon, and also that sense of, of, of loss, that sense of what my father uh, left behind and was never able to, you know, reconnect with again. Mm -hmm. So that sadness is there as well. Yeah, and you know, I also think it's so interesting <clears throat> because Shelley is, he's kind of an opportunist. You know, he, and, and even the way you described him in that passage where he's, you know, belly crawling and he's oozing. And, and there's just a way that he seems to approach the world that's both optimistic and he's always looking on the bright side. But then he's, he's not shy about kind of making the most of an opportunity. And I'm just curious to know, like, how did you balance that and and how did you make that part of his story what were you, what were you thinking if you were thinking anything yeah i was thinking he's he has to he has to live by his wits because he has nothing else mm. right his mother has died when he's very young his father is broken into pieces by this loss his father can't really parent him his father is so changed by grief um, that he can't be a proper father to Shelley. And so Shelley, since the time he's very young, has had to learn um, and do by the seat of his pants. And um, so he's, yeah, I, how do you write a character who both has to be opportunistic, but also um, is a, 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 a quite an optimistic, cheerful cheerful person, and there's a certain naivete to him, of course. He comes to the U.S. thinking, thinking that poets are, are grandly celebrated in the U.S., and they get the biggest houses and the best cars right. as keepers of the famous American freedoms, he tells us. So Shelley is, um, uh, he, he, he is not ashamed to be that kind of person. He's not grasping, but he does have his eye out for the main chance. Yeah, yeah, and just kind of plunges ahead and, you know, is kind of able to maneuver and, and but I, I just so appreciated his optimism and his sunny kind of disposition despite everything that that was happening around him. So. Yeah, I th you talked about that word balance. I mean, I think that's always tricky, right? And mm -hmm. to getting that balance right. And of course, I wanted to make him naive, but I didn't want him to be a fool. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to make him so naive that it became tedious to read that. It can be grating to be around somebody who's too naive, right? Mm -hmm. But it can also be off-putting to be around somebody who's always in your face. Yeah. So, yeah, just finding, you know, just just testing the water. It's just, but I just love that Shelley's a sponger. I mean, <laughs> so, so I have a friend who was raised by a British father and a, a Danish mother, and her father would always talk about the spongers, and I... I, I <laughs> I just love that word. It's, you know, it, um, it's so appropriate. Someone who's sort of soaking up the, the things that others have, um, have uh, you know, are, the, 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 the money or the power or the whatever, the opportunities of others and trying to get a little bit for themselves. Yeah. And Catherine, you know, do you, I found myself kind of chuckling, you know, at, at various points in this book. Do you think of yourself as a funny writer? As a sponger? No. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. But do you, you know, humor is also something that's, that's really hard to achieve, you know? I mean, there's some people who just set out and they just write a funny book, right? How did you, did you think of humor when you were kind of moving through the, the various drafts? Was that something that you were trying to do or... How did you approach the humor in this Yeah, I, I just I don't, didn't dare approach it at all. Just, mm. just, just write and try to stay loose. And yeah, there's nothing deadlier, I think, than for me than trying to write a joke. That would be beyond. It's actually beyond me to try to write a joke. And so just, just try to stay loose and yeah. listen to the character. Let the character speak, speak for himself. Yeah. And, 
hope for the best. Um, I want to get back to some questions about the outer sunset. One of the things that I just so appreciate about this city is all of the distinct neighborhoods with their own personalities and their own histories and quirks and you know little nooks and crannies. So can you share, how did you pick the outer sunset as the, the place to, to set this book? Yeah, I, I, the outer sunset is one of my favorite neighborhoods, but it, it was more than that. I think, you know, there, the outer sunset, People throw a lot of shade. Let's let's face it. <laughs> the outer sunset's kind of the butt of a lot of jokes in San Francisco, right? It's so foggy, it's so cold, it's so uniform. Um, and yet, in its time, at the time it was developed, the outer sunset really was the land of opportunity mm. for a lot of people, particularly people... Um, uh, immigrant families, maybe especially those whose families had been in San Francisco for a generation or two. Um, and this meant, mean, just this means something to me because my parents came from China, they were students, they had nothing. Um, they lived in Ohio and then they lived in Pennsylvania. And when I was born, they were living in a small rental house in Levittown. Um, we didn't live there very long, but th when they brought me home from the hospital, that's, that's where they brought me, to Levittown. And I think of the Outer Sunset as a kind of Levittown of San Francisco, yeah. right? The, it was developed by um, a couple of different develop housing development companies, and those homes were affordable. They were available and affordable to working class and, and, and lower middle class income families. Um, and one of the things that the book considers is not only transnational migration, but migration within the city of San Francisco. So you have a, you know, you have this family. Um, I have the character of Ted, and his um, family uh, has migrated from Chinatown to the Outer Sunset. His parents. His, I'm sorry, his grandparents buy a small grocery store on the best corner in San Francisco at 46th of Noriega in 1950. And that was a time when, you know, people are, the, the housing stock is built in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s. And then, you know, people are leaving Chinatown and coming to, coming to the outer sunset as early as 1950. Mm. Now, in the story um, and in reality, uh, this couple, um, like, like, like people at that time, this Chinese couple, Chinese American couple, they're not able to buy a home in the outer sunset because of restrictive covenants. And that was the case, you know, only, really only white families, even though they were of, um, of immigrant descend lines of descendant, descendancy, you know, Italian families, uh, 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 Irish families, but the Chinese, the blacks, the Jews, they were all kept out by restrictive covenants until the federal law changed and state law changed. So um, the outer sunset is interesting to me for that sort of sense of opportunity, that place of migration within the city of San Francisco, um, and then this interesting legal history of the restrictive covenants and then the wiping away of those covenants and slowly the neighborhood changing. And I guess I'll just say one other thing about choosing a very specific neighborhood like that, which is particularly pertinent to me today, um, even more so than when I began writing the book. You know, San Francisco is represented in the media so much um, by our tech titans and our ultra billionaires and we're portrayed that way uh, so often, but how it really interests me are the small na are the neighborhoods and the small businesses that make up our neighborhoods, the merchants who serve our neighborhoods, our communities. So that's what I'm most interested in and that's what I wanted to write about. Yeah. I, I, if you could see my brain, I have so many questions about all of this, so I'm trying to keep track of, of all the different things I want to ask you, but did you know that history of the Outer Sunset before you started writing, or was that something that you, you know, kind of explored as you were writing? How did you, you know, it's one thing to, to pick a neighborhood because, you know, you drive past it or you drive through it just in your day-to-day -day life, but it's another thing to really 
get in there and, and immerse yourself. And so did you have any personal experience with that neighborhood or? Yeah, I, I knew a little bit about it. I, I think because of that fabulous building on Judas Street, um, the, the old headquarters of the Dolger Company. I'm sure some people here know of this building. It's kind of an art deco building that um, is on Judah in the inner sunset. And so I'd pass that building many times. Um, and I, I used to, in fact, a lot of this book was written in the library at Kalmano, the Kalmanowitz Library at UCSF. And so I would often walk by that building, the Dolger headquarters. This was the headquarters of one of the development companies that built a lot of the housing in the outer sunset. Mm -hmm. And it interested me, and then I began to do more research. And um, of course, the library was a place where I came to do a lot of that research. Um, walk in the streets. The um, Chinese Historical uh, Society, uh, Chinese Historical Society of America, w fantastic um, research and, and museum that we have right here in Chinatown. They did a wonderful exhibit called Chinese in the Sunset, mm -hmm. and I went to the opening of that, and I met a. There were a bunch of people from the neighborhood there, or people who had moved out of the neighborhood further migrations, you know, people leaving, going to the peninsula. And um, I did a bunch of, took a bunch of oral histories. Oh, wow. Yeah, and um, got some of the ideas uh, that, were, that showed up in the book. But, you know, the library was so much a part of, of learning um, about the city um, and about, um, about the stories behind this, this story uh, in the Chinese groove. The library has been so important to me, and that's one of the things that I'm, I'm so pleased about to be here with you today, because the library has been, I wouldn't be a writer. I wouldn't be a writer without the public library from my earliest years to now. Yeah, I understand, I understand that. Yeah. Um, I want to <clears throat> get into some of the themes of the book, and you've already mentioned redlining, and you know, that kind of leads, feeds into this larger uh, question about the idea of house and home in this book and what that means and how Shelley experiences that and also the commentary that he offers, right, as he's kind of moving about the city uh, from Ted's and then, you know, different, different uh, spaces he occupies. So can you share a little bit about that idea, that theme of house and home and what you were thinking of when you were when you were writing Shelley's story. Yeah, it's hard not to think about it if you live in San Francisco, right? Yeah. It's such it's such a huge issue for us. It's so present in our lives. Um, and it's such a fundamental need for every person to have a house and beyond that to have to have a home, I mean to have housing and to have, to have a safe, secure place. Um, so I knew that was gonna be a part of the book. I wasn't gonna try to write about uh, uh, our city. I wasn't gonna try to write about San Francisco without dealing, grappling with that issue in some way. And one of the things I decided to do very early on was to move Shelley from housing situation to housing situation. Um, so that we get a little sense of what that looks like for different people in our community. And so you see him, you know, first he, he's imposed himself on his uncle and aunt, and he's living, you know, he's sleeping on the couch. And then they throw him out, and then he has to crash with a friend, so he's sleeping on their floor. And then he goes to a boarding house. Um, and then he you know, he finally figures out how to get himself a gig, taking care of this old man, Henry. Um, but we also visit a single room occupancy hotel where Grandma Lowe lives. So showing different kinds of housing situations, but also considering what makes a home. Because Shelley is just yearning to be part of a family. That's one of his three main goals, right? I want to find a new family. He's so... Uh, he feels so underserved, so so disconnected to his biological family. Even his father, whom he loves, he feels disconnected from uh, what he's left behind in China. So he 
he's you know he's 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 yearning for a family and for a home <coughs> here, and that, those were all thoughts that I had in my head very much at the at the start of the book and carrying throughout. <coughs> you know, one of the it was a brief moment, but it was a moment of real <coughs> excuse me revelation to me when. Shelley is sharing that room with <coughs> <coughs> Why now? <laughs> <laughs> Throw out a word and I'll, I'll keep talking. <laughs> <coughs> All right. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about, um, and I'm going to guess that Natalie's going to ask me a question about this at some point, was storytelling. <coughs> because... Um, this is a family that doesn't communicate with each other very well. <coughs> oh, there's a lot of silence in this family. There's a lot of holding back. And um, I, I, wanted, I, mean, I think it's painful and it's very human that sometimes <coughs> the people that we find hardest to speak to are people in our family. Um, and so I, I, I think about why stories are so important to us, and there are many, you know, many people have spoken on this, but I think one of the reasons is it does allow us to communicate to our family members um, and to, to have connection with people in our family. And one of the things that um, was a delight in, in when I was working on this book was I learned about this Chinese folktale of the peach blossom forest. It's not a story that I'd ever heard before. And I, I went home and I asked my mother, um, have you ever heard of this story about the peach <coughs> blossom forest? And my mother looked at me like I was crazy. She, it would be like one of my kids saying to me, have you ever heard of this story about Cinderella? I mean, it was, it was, of course, part of my mother's growing up. It's a, it's a well-known folktale. Every child learns it from the earliest age. You know, and it became so fun for mom and I to look up different versions of the tale, to find anime versions on, on the Internet, to, you know, find different written versions. And it was a way that my mother and I were communicating a certain kind of love and bond um, in, through story. <coughs> that we had, you know, sometimes we, we weren't really able to talk to each other like that. But the other amazing thing that happened, and this is part of what I was talking about when I was thinking about how my, the writing of the book has to do with my father was, um, okay, so Connie spilled the beans. I was a lawyer for a number of years. <coughs> I, I was like a really good student. And I loved reading, but I didn't, I didn't, uh, <laughs> Thank you, Kara. I love reading, but I never envisioned for myself the life of a writer. I mean, that just seemed beyond the pale. And I became a lawyer. Um, but always in the back of my mind, there was just this little question. I wonder if I could ever actually learn how to be a writer, because I love the form of the novel. I always wanted to read novels, and I just, yeah, just somewhere in the back of my mind, I just kind of wondered, I wonder if I could learn how to write a novel. Um, but my parents, it just seemed to me impossible to ever go to my parents and say, I would like to learn to, I would like to quit being a lawyer and become a novel. No way, right? But one day, I was practicing lawyer. My father showed me something that just floored me. He had, my silent father, he was a very quiet man, very reserved, very dignified man. He had gone to a reading, a reading at a local bookstore. My dad had gone to see the writer David Murrah, the Japanese American sansei, um, uh, Japanese American who had written a memoir called Turning Japanese Memoir of a Sansei. And my dad had gone to this reading and he bought the book and he had David Murr, he'd gone up and he'd asked David Murr to sign it. And my dad showed me, he opened up the book and on the title page, it said, for Jim Ma, fellow traveler. Mm -hmm. And my father was just so, I don't know, it spoke something to, I, it, it, it gave me a glimpse into my father's internal emotional life that I, I hadn't had. 
And I think it's because of stories. You know, that was, a, that was a man, David Murrow, who had written down his story, and somehow that story had connected with my father in a way that I had no idea that my father had that yearning in him to hear that story and had that capacity to receive it. Yeah. And it was a gift to me, and I think that is why I know in my bones that stories are very, very powerful. Yeah, they're, they are transformative, I agree. And you know, the flip side of storytelling is silence, right? And that was, as I was reading The Chinese Groove, that was one of the things that I was thinking about. What these characters say to each other and what they don't say. How they think about things and, you know, how they communicate. And grief is another theme in this book that I think is so powerful. And so can you talk about that and, and how you came to imagine that as, as other themes that you were thinking about? Yeah, <clears throat> yes, Shelley, Shelley dislodges something for everyone and for himself, I guess. He, he, he comes, he arrives, he dislodges something in this frozen, this family frozen in their grief, frozen in their silence. Mm -hmm. um, and I, do, I did want that sadness in the book. I mean, we talked about him being an optimistic, joyful man, young man, but... Um, I, I, do, I did want that grief and sadness flowing beneath the, beneath the motion of the story. I, I belong to a book club I've belonged to for many years, and we've read hundreds of books in common, and one of our members likes to say, the best books are the saddest books, and I, I agree with him. I, I, but recently I've been thinking, why do I agree with that sentence? What, what is it about that? Why, why does that hit me in the heart and say, yeah, I, I, I feel that? Um, and I'm wondering if maybe that's because books allow us to practice grief. Mm. Um, they don't inoculate us against grief or loss, right? If we are lucky, 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 if we are very, very lucky, we live long enough to experience loss and grief because there's no life that escapes that. You have to live a long time in order to you know, have the full range of human experience, but, so you're lucky, right, if you live a long time, but you're not gonna escape loss and you're not gonna escape grief. And maybe there's something about reading that helps us survive it. I don't know, I'm, I'm you know, we were talking about the public library and I've just flashed when I was saying that earlier, that when I was a kid, my mom would drop me off at the public library until I was old enough to ride my bike there by myself. And I remember checking out The Yearling by Marjorie Rawlings and reading that book and bawling yeah. my eyes out, right? Is there, that book was so sad. Did it somehow prepare me for adulthood? Maybe it did. Yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe, what do you think? Well, you know, I'm thinking <clears throat> that that comment makes me think about, you know, th this trend, you know, a few years ago with people on Instagram, right? And they're reading these books, these sad books, and they're crying on, on the screen. And, and, but those books are wildly popular. And they're, they're, I think there is something about having the experience of being able to fall headlong into a book, and it just takes you through the range of emotions. And you're able to feel that gut-wrenching sorrow you know, but you know you're on a journey, and I don't know. I, I don't know, Catherine, but I agree with you that yeah, there's something yeah. about it. But, but I think they help us to survive, not because the characters in the story survive, and it's right. like, here's a model, or here's an example, and you too will survive. Not like that, but because the writer actually wrote the story down yes. and yeah. is saying, this is what it means to be fully human. Yes. I agree with you. I agree with you. And, and to experience the, the bitter and the sweet, right? right. The, 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 the joy and the pain. It's that toggling between the two, you know, that I think as a reader is so satisfying. And as a writer, if you can strike that balance, you know, and then hand that off to the, to the reader, it, it is very satisfying. And 
there's something about the novel. I mean, something about the novel. The novel, yeah. that big baggy yes. thing that is the novel, which yes. can go here, can go there, and you know, maybe time, at times it goes a little bit too much all over the place, but it can do those multiple things. The novel is particularly good at um, satisfying the different needs that we have as, as readers yeah. and um, showing the different, the different sides yeah. of, all those, of all those feelings. I think yeah. that's true. I'm looking at the clock and I want to make sure that we leave time for audience questions. So um, I'll ask one more question. Okay. Um, and that is about this idea of the Chinese groove. And is that an actual thing? And maybe I just missed it, but so I know for black people, when you see a black person on the street, you give them the nod, right? <laughs> it's just that little, hey, what's up, I see you, right? <clears throat> you don't have to know them, but you, it's that I see you thing. And that's what I was thinking about as I was reading the Chinese groove, like, is this a real thing? So can you talk a little bit about, you know, like, is it, is it, is it something in the community? Is there something that you tap into? I don't know. That's just where my imagination yeah, took me. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Well, first of all, Shelley has made up this silly phrase. I, I don't know. It, it came to me. It, it's a Shelleyism. It's not something. It's not something that I've I've heard you know um, other other Chinese Americans say. But I have been to my share of rock concerts, comedy shows, whatever, and you always have like. You know, you, you know, you guys have been to concerts. And you, you, you get the performer up there and he says, or she says, anybody here from Cleveland? Mm. And there's always somebody at the back and they're like, yay, Cleveland. <laughs> I mean, I think people love to identify with their people, right? They, they want, they love that recognition. They love that moment. It only lasts for a moment. Maybe it's not a deep and meaningful connection, but there is some connection there. Mm -hmm. And Shelley, well, we talked about earlier, he has to look out for the main change. He has nothing going for him. He's a survivor. So he puts his faith in this idea that there's going to be help. There's going to be a safety net for him. And he calls it the Chinese groove, and he's like, my fellow countrymen are not going to let me down. And of course, mm. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, we, right away we know he's in trouble because when he's on the airplane and the steward hands him a can of soda and tells him he doesn't have to pay for it, he's like, that's the Chinese groove. Right, right. And, <laughs> and the reader is going, no, man, no. <laughs> no, everybody gets a free soda. Right. So right away we know he, this kid is, you know, maybe he's going to get into some trouble here. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Thank you so much for, yeah, for thank you, clarifying yeah. that. Yeah. I appreciate thank that. Thank you for the question. Well, let's open it up for questions. Uh, anybody in the audience here? There's a gentleman right here in the front. Okay. All right. So I, I like the way the book ended. I wasn't sure if I was or not because I didn't know where it was going to end. And for me, I'm from New Orleans, so it was like a little bit of land yap at the end of the book. It was really good. Um, how did you come up with that ending? Because I was trying to imagine all the different ways this could end, happy, sad, whatever. And I just, I felt connected to the end. So I was curious about that. And how you brought in the app into the ending made it even more kind of good, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. The question about the ending. Okay, we talked about walking a fine balance. I'm going to walk a very fine balance here. I'm going to answer your question, and I'm not going to give away the ending. <laughs> because, okay, there might be a, there might be some people who still who still want to you know keep the keep the suspense, and it it, it and it is a book meant to be read for the enjoyment of the surprises. Shall I just say that? Um, but the ending. It came to me maybe about a third of the way through the book. I suddenly realized, oh, this is what's going to happen. I don't plan out books. I don't, I mean, I don't plan the plot. Um, I did do a lot of careful mapping of the plot as I went because I wanted a lot of things to happen to Shelley. I wanted him to have a year just packed full of experience, right? And I wanted to have him 
like running from pillar to post, having to serve this person and serve that person and do this and do that. Um, and so there were a lot of possibilities for an ending. When you open that many plot points, you know, there are a lot of possibilities in how the book might end. And when you write a novel, the beginning of it is, uh, Natalie knows this, you're just opening, 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 opening. And then at some point you have to pivot and you have to start to close it down, you know. But maybe about a third of the way through, maybe even halfway through, because I wanted to leave open the possibility that something different would happen. And then I thought, oh gosh, this is how it's going to end. And then... And then you have a little bit of a target to, to work toward, which is, which is good. Yeah, but I'm, I'm glad you like the ending. Some people have complained about it to me. Can't do anything about that now. <laughs> Thank you. Also a woman in the front row, too. So... Um, Pleasure to be here. This is amazing. First time. <laughs> um, my life number is eight. I brought an eight. Oh, wow. And I, I just want to hear your understanding or your explanation of your 888, the, the keychain in the book, and uh, we'll love to, to hear that. Oh, my God. I just thought of another thing about my dad. Oh, my God. Dad, your dad, you're with me today. Wow. Um, well, yeah. In the, in the Chinese culture, the number eight is a very lucky number. Um, my father was born in China, as I said, and so he, his, he's born, his birth date is on the lunar calendar. And um, when he came to the United States, he had to fill out all this paperwork, and he was going to be a student, and he was, um, you know, doing his documentation. They asked him what his birth date was, and um, he, the lunar calendar doesn't exactly map onto a Western calendar, but he, fig he, he realized he was born in the month of August, so he chose August 8th as his birthday because it was super lucky. It was double lucky, 8-8, eight, eight, and that's always sort of stayed with me. And, yeah, yeah, I, I just 8-8 eight, eight is, a, is a lucky number, and Shelley's not a superstitious guy. Shelley's, Shelley's modern. He's not, he's not someone who lives by superstition, but, you know, the people around him, the older people around him, um, like the cook, you know, the, he's still, he still lives by superstition. So yeah, the number eight became, became a kind of talisman to me. I, one of the things I enjoy as a novelist is sort of sprinkling through the book, uh, you know, running motifs, like little things that you go back to little, you, you're dropping clues to yourself as you go, and then you can always go back and touch it again. And, you know, it's like little guideposts along the way. Um, so you've talked about uh, Shelley and all his characters, Shelley and his characters, and even your father and his possible role in this book. If you had to pick one person, place, thing about this book that's really Catherine and not Shelley, what would that be? Oh. I'm glad you have to answer that question. Natalie, you know me well. What would you say? <laughs> oh, no, this is all on you. This is your show, you might guess. <laughs> oh, I know. It's the language. It's just language. I just love, I don't know, I just love words. It was, that's why I ended up being a lawyer. I, the only thing I really knew how to do was talk. <laughs> I mean, I like to read and I like to talk. And what was that going to lead me to, right? So I, I became a lawyer. Language and... That was one of the great pleasures of writing from the point of view of, 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 of Shelley because he loves language. He's always playing with it. He's very playful. He makes up words. He doesn't really care whether he gets it exactly right. So I think, I think that's where I live in the book. That's, that's, that's the most Catherine part of the book, just the words, yeah. Great question. Um, first of all, I just I loved the book, and I just loved all the character development. Um, but Henry struck me most as you know very interesting in his relationship with the supervisor. And I, you know, living in San Francisco, knew about the similar situation that happened here. 
So that, and um, also his relationship with, um, I forgot her name, but um, the best friend, huh? Kate. Kate, yes. And moving down to the kibbutz-like, you know, place in Southern California. So if you can talk more about that, it would be really interesting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for reading the book so, so thoughtfully. Um, well, it's a book about fathers and sons, and um, I, 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 I created these pairings, right? So there's Shelley and his father, and there's Ted and his father. But then there are sort of these substitute father and son relationships. Henry is a kind of father figure to Shelley. And, um, and Henry, because his own son, Ted, does not get along with Henry, Henry develops a relationship with a younger man who was Ted's classmate and playmate when he was young. And so these sort of substitute sons come into the picture and fulfill a certain role. And it just gave me a chance to consider what do we look for in, in, a, in, a, in a relationship between, with our parent and what the parent might need that the, that the child can't supply. Where, where, the, where is the parent gonna look elsewhere for the kind of love and attention? And Henry's a very poignant figure to me because he's alone, um, he's cranky, and um, he's, he doesn't understand his son at all and vice versa. So in, when he finds that there is another young man, his son's age, who pays attention to him, who seems to respect him because that's so important to Henry, to be respected, to be seen. Mm -hmm. We were talking about being visible. Um, that's a relationship that Henry really cares about, and so it is. Yeah, it, it. You know, when the plot turns on Henry, it, it's a moment. It's a moment in the book. Yeah, I enjoyed. I, en I really enjoyed writing the character of Henry. Yeah, he, he was. He was. He was complicated to me, and not necessarily likable off the bat. And that's always a challenge for the for the writer and the reader. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello, Catherine. <laughs> Um, you know I love the book, and um, there's so much about it, but Shelley is truly such an optimistic, endearing figure. You, you, you really love him and want to find out what happens, and some, you know, that, that's a big piece of it. But one thing we haven't talked about is the humor in the book, and there's a lot of situational humor. And I wonder, like, how do you write situational humor? Does, do you look for opportunities throughout the book? Do you go back and say, I need some more humor? Does it just come to you? Mm. But there, I mean, there's a lot of times where you just, you build and you build and then you find yourself laughing and it's just, it's wonderful. And I, it, it struck me about the book, so. Thank you. You know, I think it goes back again to language. I think it goes back to language because, um, gosh, the English language, that's the only language I speak, but it's so, it's just such a, there's so much subtlety and nuance available to us through the English language and through vocabulary and through the arrangement. I mean, <laughs> I mean, this is embarrassing to admit, but I just love just rearranging words on the page. I just love playing with sentences and phrases. And the, a lot of the humor, I think, just comes out of the way it sounds to me, sonically. I mean, I am writing for the sound of the sentences, how they hit the ear, and the rhythm. And I do at some point when I'm working on a draft, I will read parts of it out loud to me, to myself. Um, now that's a little dangerous as a writer because you can, you can fool yourself into thinking that something's better than it is when you read it out loud, right? Do you find this, Natalie? Like, yeah. If it's a little not, if it's not really clear on the page and you read it out loud, but you infuse it with the right, right. You know, right, right. And it you can, can think, oh, damn, that sentence is good. But maybe it's not. Right. Yeah, that's true. So you have to be real careful when you read out loud. But <clears throat> if it's funny, you know, if, it, if the humor is there, I can hear it. I can hear it in the sentence. I, I just listen for that sonically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's part of it, for sure. Great question. I think I have time for maybe one more yeah, question. I was going to say. I have um, a hypothetical for you. The, 
when Shelly was kicked out after he was with Ted and Aviva for a week um, versus when Kate needed a place to stay, they opened up their doors to him really quickly. And I just wanted to ask you the question, if Shelly was open with them and told them, I have nowhere to go, would they have actually opened up the doors for him and let him stay? Or was that something that they just did because they cared about their friends and they didn't really care about Shelly? I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch that quite. What did, can you repeat that for me, Natalie? Uh, I can do it one more time. I'll yeah, make a little closer me. and speak a little louder. <laughs> so um, when Shelly was kicked out, yeah. Ted and Aviva um, kind of didn't really care what his situation was and what was going on with him. Oh. So my question to you is, if Shelly would have spoke up and told them, I don't have a place to go, would they have opened the door, their doors to him the same way they opened it to Kate and company? Oh, or oh. was that something that was just done, like, just kind of curious, do you think they would have actually like kept them and given them a place to stay if they would have actually known what would have happened? Yeah. Kind of the same way, like when their friends, their house burned down, they opened up their doors to them and mm -hmm. they, you know, the son's room, they went out of their way to make space for someone else. But was it the fact that they had a close tie to those individuals is why they opened their doors to him? And Shelly, they didn't have a close tie to him is why they were like, mm. yeah, just yeah. like go on your way. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're, you're asking because they did open the doors to their friends but they were very reluctant to house Shelley at the beginning. In fact, they kick him out after two weeks, right? Um, well, we don't know because <laughs> it didn't happen. But what we do know, we know a couple of interesting things. Um, we know that Ted and Aviva do not agree about how to treat this young man, right? They don't agree. Ted feels like they... I mean, he says, I promised them two weeks, and she's like, listen, one week is enough. So we already know that there's tension in the family over it. There's disagreement. And we also know that, rel we know this from our life experience, relatives do feel some obligation to family members most of the time. Most of the time when you, you know, when, when a cousin, even if it's a distant cousin, you feel some connection to yeah. that person. You want to do right by them. Um, and that creates a kind of tension. And I think, um, I think it's interesting that you ask that question because you've, you've clearly responded, you've, you've felt that tension in the book and they've, they're being contradictory. You know, I mean, Ted and Aviva are being contradictory. They're doing it for one set of people, but they're not doing it for Shelley. And why is that? What does that reveal to us about those characters and about that situation? And contradictions are, uh, you know, are, are, are a wonderful place to put your attention when you're reading a book or a story or watching a play or a movie. Or a, how, when characters act in, in ways that are contradictory to themselves, what they just said or how they acted in an earlier scene, it makes us sort of sit up and take notice and saying, wait a minute, you just told us A and now you're doing B and what's the deal here? What should I believe? Um, and isn't that a lot like real life, like when a friend says one thing to you and then does another, or when someone in your family does that to you, and you ask yourself, well, I don't know what to trust here. I don't know what to believe. And then you have to, you have to deal with the subtlety of it, and that's part of becoming an adult, and that's part of what Shelley yeah. has to learn how to do, yeah. right? Yeah. I am so grateful to all of you yeah. for coming. Thank you today. all for being Thank here. You. My pleasure. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And we're going to do this again really soon for our next One City, One Book. Catherine, Natalie, thank you so much. Please make your way out of the auditorium to the Corette Lobby, where you can buy books. Catherine and Natalie will be joining us for a book signing momentarily. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.